Good morning. Welcome to the Loray Baptist Church. It's a beautiful Lord's Day, isn't it? Amen. Amen. It's so good to see you here today, and I know that you are as excited about coming to worship the Lord as I am. I always look forward to these days where we can gather together to, to share God's Word and to hear about the Lord and our Lord Jesus and what He did for us and just to worship um, His holiness. Amen? Amen. 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 In your worship guide today, you will find a form for deacon nomination. And those names on the bottom are names that you do not choose, okay? Those are, those are the current deacons, um, some of which are going to be rotating off, but they get a year off. And so, so we, we're going to use other, other folks in the, in the church body. And there's a, if you don't have a list, there's a list in the hallway. But we need those nominations today, um, and Christine will tally the numbers and get those to Robert. And if Robert gives you a call, Robert, right, you need to prayerfully consider what the Lord wants you to do, okay, to help, help this church and the work in our church. So four names, nominate four, and then next week uh, we'll have a ballot, and we'll have names to select from from that ballot to serve our church for the next three years. And then you will also find your Ponseria um, form, whether it's uh, for memory or in honor of. So you've got that information. Those will be placed in the church sanctuary during the Advent and Christmas season. So I hope that uh, you'll, be, you'll be able to participate in that to make our, our church um, very beautiful for the upcoming seasons. You know, I've got about uh, four more weeks on this. Um, and uh, Santa Claus is coming to town, right? Good old St. Nick will be here uh, in about four weeks. Now, the Sunday after, you may uh, see a different man up here in the pulpit. I remember seeing someone not long ago, and they looked at me like, well, who are you? I don't even know who you are with that beard. Uh, so if, if, if you prefer the old look, it'll be back before too long. Uh, for, those, for those of you who like this, well, you probably have to wait again until next year after, after the second. If you want to see it the last day, you need to come and help at the children's party, right? That's right, which will be held on the 2nd of December. Okay, now, next week we will have the... Uh, Gift bags available for the homebound um, out, out in the hallway, and you'll receive more information about that in a phone tree this week. So that will be, that will be coming up. Uh, you'll hear more about that uh, then. Uh, but that's, that's the basics uh, uh, for you. So be, be preparing for that. And the scouts need your non-perishable foods by Friday. And then Saturday morning, you're going to take them where they need to go, right, Jason? Okay, so we'll, we'll do that. And thank you, Jason and Emily, for providing the able-bodied boys to move the, to move the, the, the piano. So we appreciate, we appreciate you doing that. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Join me as we have our call to worship. God, we worship you in thankfulness and praise. May the presence of each of us here encourage others so that we may go forward in faith and hope and love. Let this place set apart speak to us of that which knows no bounds, the heaven of your presence. Let this time set apart speak to us that of that which transcends time, the eternity of your love. Let the things that we hear speak to us of things that cannot be told. And let everything that we see help us to serve more truly you whom we cannot see. Amen.
Sometimes the scripture readings that we have speak uh, so powerfully to our current situations. And these are, are passages that are found uh, in the lectionary um, that we use to guide us through a study of God's word over a three-year period of time. But sometimes they just really speak to us. Vindicate me, my God, and plead my cause against an unfaithful nation. Rescue me from those who are deceitful and wicked. You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my joy and my delight. I will praise you with a lyre, O God, my God. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Let us prepare for prayer this morning. was nearly a week ago that our dear sister and the Lord Sue left this world to be with her Heavenly Father, leaving us behind. 
and Mercy and Jason, we want you to know that our love for Sue is uh, now for you. And we just pray that you'll uh, allow us to minister to you in the days ahead. And we hope that you will be a part of our fellowship uh, in the future. Join me in prayer. Oh God, the giver of life and the receiver of our spirits when our soul departs from these bodies, we pray to you today that as we gather in this place and as we receive your word, as we sing your praises, that you will comfort our hearts in our minds in these days. We know, Lord, that your grace is sufficient. We know that your love is true. And give us, Lord, the strength of your mercy in these days to follow you. Now, Lord, we pray for all those who are homebound, all those who are sick, all those who need assistance and care we pray for those who are homeless and for the weak and for the downcast we pray for those who are hungry and thirsty and seek your righteousness but have not yet found a home we pray lord you'll send them our way that we may receive them and love them and give them your grace as we meet them along the way. Now, Lord, take these prayers of our hearts to your eternal home that you may hear them and act upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson is a prophetic lesson from Micah. In the third chapter of his book, we're reading verses 5 through 12. It says, This is what the Lord says. As for the prophets who lead my people astray, they proclaim peace. If they have something to eat, but prepare to wage war against anyone that refuses to feed them. Therefore, Night will come over you without visions and darkness without divination. The sun will set for the prophets and the day will go dark for them. The seers will be ashamed and the diviners disgraced. They will all cover their faces because there is no answer from God. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression, to Israel his sin. Hear this, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, who despise justice and distort all that is right, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with wickedness. Her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortunes for money. Yet they look for the Lord's support and say, Is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. The temple hill, a mound overgrown with thickets. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Our next hymn is hymn number 308. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior.
Our gospel lesson today is from Matthew's gospel, chapter 23, verses 1 through 12. Now before I read this, let me just say a little bit about how this comes into Matthew's gospel. Jesus had been tested by the Sadducees and by the Pharisees. And after he made his uh, replies to them, Matthew's gospel says... No one asked him any more questions that day. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to the disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not li willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi for you have one teacher and you are all brothers and do not call anyone on earth father for you have one father and he is in heaven nor are you to be called instructors for you have one instructor the Messiah the greatest among you will be your servant for those who exalt themselves will be humble, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. These are the words of our Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Thank you. 
you, Christine. Do you remember that game we used to play uh, when we were kids called musical chairs? Remember that? Teacher would put a bunch of chairs in the center of, of the floor, and there would be one less chair than the number of students or kids that were in the, in the, in the building. And they start the music, and we start going around those chairs, and then the music would stop, and everybody would scramble to find his chair. But there's always one person left out, and they'd have to go sit and wait till the game was over. And another, and they start the music, and another chair was taken out, and here again, everybody started going around until the music stopped, and someone else was eliminated from the game until you got to one person who got the final chair. Well, the Pharisees, Sadducees, they, they did not have to worry about finding their seat. Because at that time, they believed that they had Moses' seat. They could sit in Moses' seat and because they were sitting there in Moses' seat, they had power and authority over the people. Now, if you read the Old Testament carefully, nowhere in it does it say that Moses had a seat. When he taught or when he preached, he was always standing before the group. That's what he did. That's what it was that was the tradition back a thousand years before Christ. But by Jesus' day, the tradition, the custom had changed so that the teachers, the rabbis, would sit while everybody else stood up. Can you imagine if I tried to implement that, that policy here? you would start hearing the doors open and close, right? But that was, that was the situation back then. That was, that was their custom um, to stand while the teachers taught. Now, in chapter 22, um, the chapter before this reading, as I mentioned, Jesus was, was tempted uh, not by the devil this time, but instead by Sadducees and Pharisees. Now the Sadducees were, were a, 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 a pseudo-political religious party. It's kind of like difference between maybe Baptists and Presbyterians or Baptists and Methodists or whatever. Kind of like that. They, they, still, they all believed in, in Yahweh and God, but... The Sadducees only believed in the first five books of the, what I, we call the Old Testament or the Torah. That was, they believed in just the Torah. They did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They did not believe there would be an end time judgment. But the Pharisees, they were more like Jesus. Je it, it, in, in that time, the Pharisees would have been considered the, it, we would be considered the good guys. They were trying to, to do things right. They were trying to, to bring reform and purity into Judaism. And unfortunately, like every religion, there are people who abuse that. They say one thing, but they do another. They expect other people to do certain things, but they take certain liberties, right? Right? And that's just a part of the human condition. Well, Jesus was obviously calling them out on that. And he was saying something that people knew. In verse, beginning with verse 3, So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up these heavy, cumbersome burdens and overloads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Yeah. 
every morning in uh, the Bethlehem Baptist Academy in Fairfax, Virginia, the, the faculty would gather in the chapel to offer up prayer requests and then pray before the day began. So you can see an assembly of, of teachers and staff coming together into the chapel there at the church before all the kids got there. And on one morning, a lady by the name of Linda Bedell, who was the second grade teacher, stood, she stood, right? She stood and faced the assembly of people to make an announcement. And she was asking prayer. She said that she has a kidney disease and that she is going to need a transplant. And the likelihood of her getting one is not good, um, but she just wants her friends and her co-workers here at, at the assembly to pray for her and pray that she'll get a kidney. Well, Debbie Thorpe was in the room, also a teacher. And when Linda spoke those words, Debbie says that she felt like God was speaking to her. She said she had two good kidneys. And her health was good. And her friend needed a kidney. How could she not give it to her? And she did. What was amazing was they had the same blood type. They had two of the six antigens that paired together. So Linda didn't have to take all the extra medication so that the organ would not be rejected. Um, it was an amazing thing. Linda Goodell would say while she was in the hospital days after the transplant, she said, I wish more people would do this. And she looked over at Debbie, the gift of life. How can you say thank you to someone who does that? Wow. Bet, both Bet, both Linda, excuse me, and Debbie answered prayers. They had a prayer asked and answered. They both followed God's will. They both practiced what they preached, what they believed about God, God's goodness, God's love, God's help, and they, they both were blessed. Jesus had more to say. Look what he says in verses 5 through 6. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. You know, the phylacteries is what you may see rolled up on Orthodox priests with a little box with the Ten Commandments in it. They have it around the arms and over their head, but, but apparently they made them wide so they really showed out so people would notice them and recognize them. And then the, and then the fringes on their, their robes, their, their head garments, their robes were, were long, um, attracting attention. He says that they love the place of honor at the banquets and the most important seats in a synagogue. When I read that, I'm reminding of, of chairs that we have sometimes in church, you know, the, I call them the king and the queen chairs, you know, that are usually up front of us. I'm reminded of those. They love those places uh, because they're, they're greeted 
treated with respect and honor. And then in the marketplaces, they love to be called rabbi or teacher. Back in the 19th century, an American tourist went to Poland um, to visit a famous rabbi there. His name was uh, Hofsetz Chaman. Now, um, when he went into the place where this rabbi was, was, was staying, he was underwhelmed by the room. There was a cot, a table, and a chair, and a, and a Bible, the Old Testament. And he said, uh, Rabbi, where's your furniture? My furniture? Where's your furniture? He asked the man. He says, well, I'm just traveling through here, passerby. I don't need furniture. And the rabbi said, me too. Neither do I. He had found, uh, that particular rabbi had found his place. He had, he had understood the humility of living this life as being a person of faith, not concerned about the trappings of the material world. Now, we all have things, and we all love to have things. That's part of our culture. Um, we are capitalists. The more we spend, the more we purchase, the better our economy. The better our rates for money that we put up. That's the American way. But sometimes we need to think about does our life reflect our faith? I'd like to hear the amen. We need to think about that sometimes. We need to realize that uh, we too like to be respected in the marketplace, don't we? We, we like to be um, affirmed on Facebook we like to get those little hearts of things that we write down or say right we want that affirmation we want that attention we want that love but we must remember the most important thing we could ever have is love and affirmation from the Father That's the most important thing. That relationship that we have with God. With our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has sacrificed so much for us. We can never give enough. But that doesn't mean we don't give. Right? We give as we are able. As we joyfully, as Paul says, give for the work of God's kingdom. Jesus wasn't finished. He, uh, he goes on, in verses 8 through 12, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you all are brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. But those who exalt themselves will be humbled. But those who humble themselves will be exalted. I thought it quite interesting that this text is on the day that we nominate people to serve us as deacons who are themselves servants whose Greek word actually means feet 
in dust. People who are willing to get their feet dirty. In the ancient world, it reflected servants that would care for people and care for those who were in need. The early apostles elected seven to serve the needs of things that were becoming overwhelming for the apostles as they taught and they preached and, and to care for the Gentile w women as well as the Jewish women in their assemblies. To pray as you nominate those who will serve us and serve us well. Jesus says that we, uh, we need to recognize that we may grow up in families with a, a, indeed a father and a mother, but our true father, the one who has truly given us life, is the Heavenly Father. And we should focus on that relationship. Now, most of us don't call our dad's father. Usually we don't. Sometimes maybe we do. But usually we, call, we have Father's Day. Most of us call, call our father's dad or, or daddy or something like that. Dad, dad, when we were growing up, right? Father is a, almost as kind of a, a distant word. There's some separation there. When, you know, if my children ever called me father, I'm like, okay, what did I do wrong? <laughs> right? I messed up somehow. I still like to, I still like to have my oldest child, Hannah, call me daddy. You know. Sometimes she calls me dad, but sometimes when she needs something, she'll say, daddy, right? And that is, it pulls on, on that old heart string. Well, Jesus is trying to remind us that, uh, that we may have teachers and instructors, um, and they may give this wisdom and understanding but we must never forget our true Messiah, our true God, and understand that no matter what we may learn from some other human being, it's not comparable to what we know and learn and receive from our God. Now, Jesus said there will be those who exalt themselves. And we don't have to look hard to find those who exalt themselves, do we? We see it in, we see it in sports. I am the greatest. We see it in politics. And sadly, we see it in the church. It happens. Dr. William Price of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, likes to tell this story about himself. Um, he was pastoring in a church, um, and one day he noticed out in the audience one of the new professors in the audience from LSU. And so, hoping that maybe he, he, he invited him to come back at the end of the service, and he said, I hope you were recurring. He said, oh, I'll be back, I'll be back. And so Dr. Dr. Trice started working on his sermons and made them as doctrinally sound and good as he could, using his best material to impress this distinguished professor that was now at LSU. And after a month of, of preaching these, these profound messages and sermons, indeed one day that professor comes forward and joins the church. After he joins the Dr. Uh, Trice asked him, he says, um, what finally made your decision? 
Was it one of the things, points that I pointed out in the sermon? Did it make you decide to, to be here and join the church? And he said, no. Nothing that you said. It's because that little woman that sits in the back, like Doris, who said to me, we're so glad you're here. And that's, that Sunday, we, you, we're not here, we missed you. He said, that's, that's why I joined this church, because someone missed me when I wasn't there. Wow. That's a story that we need to remember, that I need to remember. Not necessarily my effort, although I try to do my best, that draws people into the faith. It's all of our efforts to make relationships and to encourage and to invite and to care for other people. Pray with me. Oh God, as we today are reminded through our Lord's words, humility brings exaltation. And exalting ourselves only leads to humility. So, Lord, use the people of this place to draw close to you by first finding a place in service, in humility before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to pray at the altar. And I want you to know there's always plenty of room.
sing that, when I sing that song, hear that song sung in congregation like this, I'm transported back to being a young man in my ministry career at Southern Seminary during uh, the uh, service before we received our diplomas. Um, and the excitement and the joy that I felt at that time and the, the longing for service uh, in the world and to serve Christ. And, and I, I wish that I could give you that feeling, what that felt like. Maybe, there's, maybe you've had some experience like that in some way, um, being called by God to go into the world and, and, and share the gospel and, and do his work. It's, it's an overwhelming, powerful experience. And if one day you feel that, that call, be sure to answer. Go in his grace and peace. Amen.